having me here. Nice to talk to everyone today. So um, I'm a family law attorney in Monterey Park and uh, happy to be here today to talk about family law, divorces, uh, community property with everyone. And uh, I'm also a licensed real estate broker myself. So I know how uh, family law and real estate intersect. I don't sell properties. Um, I just uh, give referrals to other real estate agents and, and get a, a referral fee that way. But my main is family law, uh, divorces, child custody, child support, uh, even restraining orders. So I'm going to um, take any questions along the way as I go through the different topics today. Um, I think some of the main topics in family law that real estate agents want to hear about is um, the difference between community property versus separate property. How do we know when something belongs to both the husband and wife and both husband and wife can sell it and split it? Um, what about separate property? How do you know if it's separate property and like maybe only the husband is entitled to it or only the wife is entitled to it? Also, um, the term transmutation of property, that's really important. So I'll discuss what is transmutation of property. And then also like uh, some real estate disclosure requirements, um, the duty for real estate agents to disclose information about the property during the divorce, uh, what are the financial disclosure steps that the parties have to go through. Um, how to divide real estate during the divorce, how to calculate what part belongs to husband, what part belongs to wife, what are their options, you know, can they sell the property, when do they uh, have a buyout, when can one party buy the property from the other party, um, how uh, restraining orders and protective orders uh, apply and how, what real estate agents have to watch out for when there's restraining orders in place. Um, and then finally, what are the, what's the mentality of these parties and how does that affect the process? So let me uh, share my screen right now. I'm going to go through the difference between community property and separate property first. Um, this is a really important part for everyone to understand. Um, and I have a diagram here that will give you a better understanding of how to calculate what's community property and what's separate property. Can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay. Yes. Awesome. Yes. So community property, um, it really depends on two very important dates. So if you see this heart right here, that's the marriage date. So that's really easy, right? That's just the date that's on the legal marriage certificate. And know that, uh, it doesn't matter where the parties got married. They could have gotten married in China, in South America, Mexico, anywhere. If they're married in one country, that means they're married in the whole world. So they don't have to come to the U.S. and get remarried. You know, they don't have to like apply for a new marriage certificate when they come to the U.S. You look at their marriage dates when they first got married, no matter what part of the world they got married in. The stop sign is the date of separation. That is the more tricky date because the date of separation is not the day that they filed divorce necessarily. There are some parties that may have separated for years before they finally decided to go through with the divorce process. Um, I had a case one time where uh, the two parties ended up spending a whole week in court litigating the date of separation. The wife said that they were married for 11 years, and the husband said that they were married for eight years. And they spent a whole week looking at all the different factors. So what factors come into play? Well, they look at so many things. They look at, you know, were the two parties sleeping in the same bed during the last three years? Were they having intimacy and sexual relationships? Um, were they holding themselves out as husband and wife when they went out to dinners or lunches or events with friends? Were they taking pictures together, like holding hands, putting their arm around each other like they were husband and wife? Were they wearing their wedding bands, their wedding rings? They even look at their social media status. What does this say on their Facebook? Is it in a relationship or is it single? And then they would even have a bunch of friends and family members come and testify as to whether or not they believed 
they were in a marriage or if they were separated during that time. And the reason why this date is so important and the couple spent so much money fighting over 11 years versus eight years is because everything that is acquired, all assets, all income that is acquired between these two dates, the date of marriage and the date of separation is property. So if the wife won and she got marriage to be 11 years instead of eight years, that means everything. So the wife was the stay at home wife and the husband was the breadwinner. So that means everything that the husband earned during the last three years, she would be able to get 50% of. And of course, the husband wanted to only have eight years of marriage because he wanted the last three years of income and assets to be his separate property. He didn't want to split 50% with his wife. So the, and they, and he did acquire a lot in the last three years, you know, the property values went up, the investments did well. And so that's why it was so important for them to have that date of separation. And the husband's arguments for eight years was that they were sleeping in separate bedrooms. They had no sexual relationships. The wife said, well, I still went out and bought groceries for us. I cooked for you every night. I washed your dishes. I did your laundry. And the husband said, well, that's what a housekeeper would do. But we weren't in a, you know, in a relationship. We weren't having any romantic relationships. We weren't going out to events and going out with friends together. But the the point that uh, actually helped the wife win was that they were still going to a marriage counseling sessions towards the end of the 11 years. So the marriage counseling session shows that they were actually working on repairing the marriage and wasn't completely separated yet. So that's how she ended up winning because of that fact. But the court took into consideration all of the different facts that could have affected the date of separation. Um, so assets acquired between the two dates are community property. The bottom part, the three green boxes are the exceptions. So exceptions include inheritance, any gifts, and also income, rents, and dividends generated by separate property. So if you guys, your, your clients have any kind of properties that were given to them by their parents or grandparents or any family members who passed away, otherwise known as inheritance, that's separate property. It only becomes community property if one of the parties adds the other spouse's name onto the property. Whenever you commingle separate property with community property, it becomes community property because California is a community property state. So everything defaults to community property and you can't prove that it's separate property. So Everything we're covering today, just know it only applies to California law because I'm a California licensed attorney and every state has different family codes. California's community property state, other states, Texas, New York, Nevada, they all have different laws. So whatever I'm covering today only applies in California. Gifts are also separate property. And let's say a husband owns an apartment building. He never asked the wife's name on it. All the income, all the rents, dividends generated by that apartment building remains his separate property during the marriage. And the wife will not be able to split it. The exception to that rule is if the parties use community income to go and enhance the separate property, let's say they make some renovations on it, you know, they they put some money in to improve the property, or um, they go and pay the property taxes, um, any kind of maintenance on the properties, which appreciates the value. Then at that point, during the divorce, if they sell the property, the other spouse can then go and get half of all the marital properties that they put into the real estate. Um, any questions on community property on this slide? What if they're using funds from whoever they inherited the property from? So not joint funds. Yeah, so if they're using inheritance funds, which is separate property to enhance separate property, then it's still separate property. But if they use inheritance funds to enhance community property, then it gets commingled with community property and it becomes community property. 
Okay, thank you. Great. What if they had had properties before they got married? If they own property before they got married, that comes to our next slide, which is the separate property slide. So everything acquired before the date of marriage is considered separate property, as long as you do not commingle it with community property. The minute you commingle it, let's say you add your spouse's name on title, it becomes community property. And when you sell it, either during a divorce or even during a marriage, parties get 50-50 or whatever percentage is on title. And then everything that's earned after the date of separation is also separate property. So does that answer your question? Okay, repeat that again, please. Everything that's acquired after the date of separation. Remember we talked about the importance. Yeah, no, but I'm referring to be before the marriage. Yeah, so do you see the heart right here? That's the marriage date. Everything yeah. acquired before the date of marriage is separate property. As long as you don't commingle it with community property after you get married. If okay. anyone has separate property, but after they get married, they commingle it, they add their spouse's name on it, it becomes community property. Okay, so if it's not commingled, uh, if I understand, uh, I, I've actually sold a lot of divorce properties. I uh, I understand, I've heard that uh, after 10 years, everything becomes uh, community property 50-50. Is that correct? So that's actually a myth. That's a that's not true. Um, there is a thing called common law marriage. Uh, and common law marriage does not exist in California. Common law marriage does exist in other states. And what common law marriage says is if you are living together for X number of years, maybe seven years or 10 years, however many years, even though you don't sign the legal marriage certificate, you automatically become husband and wife. And then that marriage date, um, everything after is community property. But in California, there is no common law marriage. So two parties can live together for as long as they want, 10 years, any, any amount of period. And as long as they don't sign the marriage legal certificate, they are not husband and wife, and there's no community property. Oh, Elizabeth, on the subject of common law marriage and the 10 years for California, does the commingling of funds, let's say the commingling is a check, a checking account, does that justify common law marriage? Or is it just clearly there's zero common law marriage, even if there's commingling of funds? So there's no common law marriage in California, but um, if two people who are not married open up a joint checking account and that account is under both their names, if they want to close that account, they're entitled each to half of that account. It's just like, you know, if two people who are not married go and buy a real estate property, even though they're not married, they own the real estate property jointly. If they were to sell it, they both have access to the funds from the, the proceeds of the sale. So th that's that's not related to common law marriage. That's just two people owning property together. Got it, got it. So the commingling. Okay, all right, great, thank you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, like for example, in Canada, there is common law marriage. If two people live together for two years, just two years, they become husband and wife. But California, doesn't matter how long. Um, you guys have probably heard of the 10-year rule because that 10 years seems like a big deal. How the 10-year rule applies in California is not on assets. doesn't have to do with real estate. It has to do with spousal support. So the minute a marriage hits the 10-year mark, it's considered a long-term marriage and spousal support all of a sudden turns into lifetime spousal support. When a marriage is less than 10 years, spousal support is only paid for half of the length of the marriage. So let's say two people are married for eight years. Spousal support is only paid for four years. But the minute it hits the 10 year mark, spousal support is paid for life. And what for life means is either the person who's paying 
has no more income, let's say they die or they're retired, they're disabled and they have no income and can't pay anymore, then spousal support stops. Or if the person who's receiving the support remarries. If those two scenarios don't happen, then spousal support is paid for life. So that's why that 10-year mark is so important. And I'll give you guys a story so you guys can remember this 10-year rule. Um, when Kobe Bryant was alive, uh, do you guys remember when Vanessa Bryant caught him cheating? She caught him cheating, but she didn't file for divorce right away. She waited until they were married for 10 years. She waited until the 10-year mark passed, and then she filed for divorce because otherwise she would only get half of however long they were married for. So after they turned 10 years, she filed for divorce and she could get lifetime support from Kobe Bryant. But then Kobe Bryant was smarter because he ended up buying her the $4 million purple diamond ring, which, you know, $4 million is cheaper than him paying her a lifetime of spousal support. And that won her back and she dismissed the divorce case. So remember that story to remember the 10-year rule. But the 10-year rule does not affect assets, does not affect real estate. Real estate is based on the rules I just shared with you on the two slides. Separate property and community property is based on the dates of marriage and the dates of separation. Does that make sense, everyone? Any questions on that? I just want to clarify the spouse that would be paying is the one with the income, isn't it? Correct. Yeah. Okay. It's all based on who makes more money. The person making more money pays the spousal support to the person making less money because the reasoning for a spousal support is to make sure when two okay. people split up, there's no big difference in lifestyle. They don't want two people who've been married split up. One person is living in a mansion. One person is on the streets. They want both parties to still have pretty similar lifestyles, at least for a few years, you know, or lifetime if it's a long-term marriage. So that it gives the person who's been staying at home, who's took a break from their career to get back on their feet. So that's the purpose behind spousal support. That's why the person making more is the one paying. And you said that they, they pay for lifetime now. Is that up until, like you said, the retirement situation or how does that, or does it continue on after retirement as far as like social security and other things? Um, it's basically paid until that person has no more income. So even if they retire from their W-2 job, if they had, had a W-2 job or let's say they're no longer working, but let's say they own a lot of investment properties and they have real estate rental income, you know, or they have social security or they have 401k, whatever income they have, as long as they have income, then spousal support continues. So this is my slide on um, alimony, aka uh, otherwise known as spousal support. It's uh, the same thing. So there's a calculator that is used by the courts and the government to calculate alimony, and that's the website. Um, it's the calculator is also known as the DISO master. And you basically put one person's income in the other person's income, and then it will say how much they have to pay. It's the same calculator that's used to calculate child support. Does that answer your question? Any other questions on spousal support or alimony or separate property or community property? So you still have to pay spousal support, even though, let's just say your ex-wife uh, is making more money than you now. No. So support can be revisited and modified. Um, during the pandemic, we had a lot of new cases because a lot of people lost their jobs. So when they lose their jobs and they can no longer pay the support, you know, or maybe their support is reduced, then they can go to court and file um, an RFO stands for request for modification, and they can attempt to change the support based on their change in income. So support can be modified and um, child support can, child support is paid until the children turn 18. So for 18 years, it can be modified. After the children are adults, this child support stops. For alimony, if it's a long-term marriage and it's um, lifetime of spousal support, then um, they, it can be modified anytime. But let's say one person is making more money 
the other person who's receiving the support can also go and modify and ask for more support. So both parties can go and ask for modifications. Okay, so so let's just say um, your your ex was, it wasn't working, so you have to give her alimony. And then all of a sudden she starts working and she's making good money. Uh, let's say she's making more money than the, the spouse. Uh, would he, he have grounds to stop giving alimony? Yes. If if she ends up making more than him, then they can. Uh, most of the time, when that happens, the two parties enter into a waiver. So um, even if there's a long term divorce, the parties can still negotiate. I've seen cases where one party will say, "I'm going to give you a lump sum of this amount of money if you agree to waive spousal support going forward." And if they want that lump sum of money, let's say they would like to put a down payment on a house, instead of slowly getting alimony month after month for years, they can agree to that. And they'll say, okay, we're going to waive lifetime alimony if you give me this lump sum money so I can go and make a big purchase right away. Yeah, that's pretty common. Yep. Yep. So they can, they can do a waiver, but, um, just make sure, you know, your, your client is doing a waiver that they fully understand what they're waiving because I have so many clients, they get buyer's remorse. In the upfront, they want that lump sum because it looks really nice and they waive it. Uh, they waive long-term spousal support. But after they spend that money and it's gone and all of a sudden they're like, hey, I actually need more support, then they regret waiving the long-term spousal support. However, if that one spouse got married, that automatically stops the support, right? Or alimony? Yes. When the person who is receiving the support, if they get remarried, and sometimes it doesn't need to be fully remarried because a lot of parties, if they're collecting good support from their ex-spouse, they, they might not want to get remarried. But even if they don't get remarried, if they're cohabitating with a new partner, and we have evidence that the new partner is supporting them, then um, we can go and file a request to terminate support too. If we can show they have a new partner supporting them, even if they're not legally married. Does so that answer that, your question? Yes, yes, but that requires evidence. Yes, that requires evidence. Yeah, some, some of the evidence we use in past cases include um, pulling out the uh, lease agreement between them and the landlord to show that the lease agreement has the other person's name on it. And then also subpoenaing bank statements to show that the other party uh, that they're depending on is paying for their rents, their uh, expenses, you know, helping them support them. So those are all evidence that we can request during the discovery process. So in the, uh, um, when time comes that we have clients like that, how do we bring that up? Do we we'll just say consult to an attorney or, you know, um, is that, you know, how do we advise? Yeah, client? definitely for anything that's legal related, um, refer them to an attorney because only attorneys can give legal advice. So you don't want to accidentally be giving legal advice. So it's best to work with an attorney when it comes to legal matters. Okay. Interesting. Thank you. Yeah. Um, I also have a slide on child support um, in case any of your clients are interested in calculating child support. It's also calculated using the DISO master and it's also modifiable. And um, child support, the additional factor that is used is the percentage of time spent with each parent. So alimony obviously doesn't depend on child custody, but child support, it does depend on time spent with each parent. So the more time a parent has for child support, then the less money they have to pay. So a lot of times the parents, your clients may be fighting for child custody, not because they want to spend more time with their kids, but because they want to pay less child support. So that's unfortunate in those situations. Um, there's also, uh, for properties, for community property, there's also the term called transmutation. Do you guys know what transmutation means? No. So transmutation is the process of converting separate property to community property or community property to separate property. 
I'm sure a lot of you guys have seen your clients who are going through divorce cases maybe sign quick claims, right? A quick claim deed that does not have the specific word transmutation has not transmuted a community property, separate property. A lot of times, let's say husband and wife own a real estate together. And the husband says, you know, I if you um, sign a quick claim deed to the wife, if the wife signs a quick claim deed, I will give you the children. You can have child custody and I want the property. So wife goes and signs the quick claim deed. Later on in court, the husband's like, okay, the property is mine. Actually, no, because if the quick claim deed does not properly have the transmutation language and say, I'm hereby transmuting community property to separate property, it doesn't, um, it's not effective. And the wife can still claim interest in the property, even though there is a quick claim deed. So that's a very common scenario that you guys should watch out for it. When your client comes to you and say, hey, I have a quick claim, my, my spouse signed a quick claim deed. I have full rights over this property. I want to sell it. Still consult with an attorney. Make sure they have full rights because otherwise, um, if the spouse finds out during escrow that um, you know the quick claim deed was not valid, they can put a pause and, and freeze the and freeze the um, the proceeds and then the sale is going to get frozen and not go through. So make sure that the term transmutation is on any document attempting to change community property to separate property or vice versa. So that's the importance of transmutation. Um, there's also um, an important topic that's very common now for prenups and postnups. So a lot of clients also have uh, prenups or postnups in place that governs if a property is community or separate. So a postnup is the same as a prenup. It's just signed after the parties are already married. Let's say when they got married, they, they didn't think about signing a prenup. It's not too late. They can always sign a postnup after. But the key is when they sign a postnup, they cannot be contemplating divorce. They have to still plan on staying together. They have to be in a happy uh, marriage attempting to stay together long-term when they sign a post-nup. If they are attempting to file divorce and then they sign a post-nup, the post-nup can be invalidated. Prenups are very commonly invalidated too. Um, there's a lot of rules uh, that have to be met before a prenup can be valid. Uh, one of the rules is that it has to be signed and reviewed at least one week before marriage. So if clients come to me saying, hey, I'm getting married in two days. Can you help me draft a prenup? I have to turn them away. I can't help those clients who don't have enough time before their marriage date. Um, the prenups will also typically specify what is the husband's separate property, what is the wife's separate property, and what is their community property. So if you're representing a client and you're not sure if uh, they're, you know, they can sell the property or their wife needs approval, um, take a look at their prenup if they have one and it should dictate. Mm -hmm. Additionally, prenups, both parties have to have separate representation um, or firm cannot represent both parties. If both parties come to us, we have to refer the one of the parties to another family law firm. We can't even have two attorneys in my firm representing both parties. That's a conflict of interest and it's going to increase the chances of the prenup getting set aside later. So we don't want to, you know, risk malpractice for that. So we always refer the other party to another family law firm. And actually recently there's new case law that says prenups are presumed to be invalid until proven valid. Before the last couple of years, prenups have always been presumed to be valid, but it's really easy to invalidate them if, let's say, one party wasn't represented by counsel, or maybe the one-week rule wasn't met, and they signed it too close to marriage. But now, it's actually presumed to be invalid until proven valid. So when you go to court with the prenup, the judge assumes that it's not valid. 
you have to bring in all this evidence that say, okay, a husband and wife, we were all represented by separate counsel. We fully understood what we were signing, what we were waiving. We had plenty of time before we got married to review everything, process everything, and we weren't really rushed. They have to bring in all these factors in order to validate it. So it's harder and harder for prenups to hold up in court. It's it's like, you know, similar to criminal law where before it's innocent till proven guilty and now the law changed to guilty until proven innocent. So more and more people, um, you know, there's there's not a hundred percent bulletproof prenup. Um any so, so the, so the yeah. wife could just say, you, you know, I, I really didn't understand. I just went along with what my husband said. Uh, and, and she could probably uh, annul the, the prenup. A lot of people do that. But the thing is, that's why it's so important for her to be represented by counsel. Because when she's represented by attorney, the attorneys also sign the prenup. So you have both parties signing and then you have both attorneys signing and alleging that they explained the terms to their client, the client fully understood, and then all four parties sign. So if the attorney sign, it's going to be hard for the wife to say, oh, I didn't understand because, hey, you had an attorney advise you and sign off on this. But if there's no attorney signing, then she can easily say, oh, I just signed it because my husband told me to. I never even read the document. I had no idea what I was signing and waiving. So that's why it's so important for the attorney to sign the prenup. What is included in the prenup? What is what it covers? So it covers property division, and it also covers spousal support. Uh, a prenup cannot cover anything related to kids. It can't, re it can't cover child support, child custody, because all that depends on the circumstances later, you know, because the courts want to rule in what's best for the kids at the time. So you can't predetermine child custody or child support. Child support is a right that belongs to the kids, not to the adults, even though the money is going to the parent, but it's, it's supposed to be for the kids. So prenups cannot cover child support or child custody, but it specifies what is separate property, what is community property. There's usually an exhibit A and an exhibit B attached to the prenup. Exhibit A will have all of the properties that husband owns. So in case of a divorce, he doesn't have to split it with wife. Exhibit B can have all the properties that wife owns. She doesn't have to split it with husband. And then they can specify in the prenup that, okay, all the properties that we earn after marriage is going to be community property. And then it can also um, specify alimony. You can say, if we're married for zero to five years and we split up, I don't have to pay any alimony. But if we're married for five to 10 years and then we split up, I'll pay you $5,000 a month. So it could say something like that. But if the judge reads the prenup at the time of divorce and they think that the terms are not reasonable, then the judge can still set it aside and make their own rules. Because family law is in a court of equity. So court of equity is all about what's fair and what's not fair. If the prenup says, um, I'm going to pay you $5,000 a month, but then all of a sudden, one of the parties made a billion dollars using crypto during the marriage, the judge is going to say, hey, $5,000 is too low. You have a billion dollars now. We're going to set aside the $5,000 that you previously agreed to in the prenup, and then we're going to recalculate it based on your actual income because the difference is too great. So that's, again, why a prenup is not 100% bulletproof. I see. How about if, uh, how do you prevent, is it true that if one one spouse, when you before you get married, has already a lot of debts, when you get married, you inherit, do you, you be part of that debt with a spouse that you get married to? Yeah, that's a great question. So all of this um, uh, stuff I talked about earlier, community property, the blue asset acquired, all of these assets also includes debts. So community debt, is all the debt that's accrued between the marriage date and the separation date. Separate debt is all the debts that were acquired before the date of marriage and the after the date of separation. So if you are married and your spouse goes to Vegas and ends up taking out a loan or loses 
like taking out a loan for $50,000 and then gambles and loses all that money, even though you didn't know your spouse was going to Vegas, you didn't give him permission, him or her, you are responsible for that debt because you are married. In a prenup, you can state otherwise. You can state that all the debts that's under my spouse's name is his separate debt and then creditors can't come after you. Otherwise, Everything your spouse ends up accruing, all the loans, all the debts, even if you didn't know about it, you are responsible because the two married parties are tied together financially. So that's another big thing to worry about. Um, I had like a, a very common scenario that my clients face is car accidents, you know, because gambling, you know, you can make choices and not, not go to Vegas, not take out a loan, not go into debt, but car accidents are not choices. You you could, you know, a pedestrian could walk in front of you and you, you hit them by accident. They're, they're called accidents for a reason. So if your spouse hits a pedestrian and they're disabled for life and, and your spouse ends up, uh, let's say the insurance policy only covers two million dollars and their injuries far exceed two million dollars and now you have to sell your home you have to sell all your assets to pay for this disabled person for the rest of their life even though you didn't hit the pedestrian your spouse did you're also on the hook because you guys are married so a lot of times these car accidents completely devastate um, a family because they end up having to support um, the, the injured person for life. Um, and that's why it's so important to have proper estate planning set up, proper trust, so that if that happens and, you know, you, you never know, it just, it happens to the, the nicest people uh, and it's unpredictable, but they find themselves in a pickle when it happens because they end up having to sell and lose all their assets to support the victim. So yeah, great question on debts. All the debts, in a marriage are also community. Does that answer your question? Great questions, by the way. Uh, yes, and uh, thank you for that, for clarification. Another thing is if that spouse, during the marriage, that spouse acquired a debt, does that debt die when that spouse die? It doesn't, no. If it's a community debt, then so, let's say uh, if it's he got it like uh, you know how you apply for individual or joint account even though if it's individual account yeah so title doesn't really govern what's separate property and what's community property right like we covered here it's not about who's on title it's about the dates it's about when the debt was accrued was it after the date of marriage before the date of separation or was it before date of marriage, after date of separation. So it's really the dates. The, if the spouse takes on a loan only under his or her name, the title doesn't matter. If it was acquired during the marriage, both spouses are responsible. Just like if if I if uh, if someone goes and buys a property during the marriage, but they only buy it under their name and not their spouse's name it's still based on the dates. If they use community property to buy property, it's still community property, even if only one person's name is on there because of the dates and because Sorry. there's no transmutation language. If there was transmutation language and the wife waived the rights to the property and say, I'm transmuting my interest to my husband. Now it's a separate property. I don't want anything to do with it. Then you can transmute it and change the conversion. But just the title, title doesn't govern. So you're saying like, let's say for a person buying a woman who is married a soul and separate property, it does not uh, prevent from getting that, you know, is that what you're trying to say? Well, if someone else buys them a property, that comes into this gift exception, right? So let's say the wife's mom buys her a property as a gift and then said, this is my daughter's still on separate property, then that's separate property because it's one of the exceptions to the community property rule. Inheritance, um, gifts, all of these green boxes are the exceptions. Yes, I'm talking about they're actually buying, let's say, uh, family, right? But only the mom has the income. So it would say uh, 
married, sole, and separate property is the so title. It, so it depends on where the money came from. If the money that's used to buy this property came from income that was earned during the marriage, mm -hmm. yes. even if the wife earned it, it does, every dollar that's earned in a marriage, doesn't matter if the wife earned it or the husband earned it, it's all community income because it was earned during the marriage. A lot of people think like, why do I have to give my spouse 50% when I worked and my spouse didn't work? I did all the work. I should have all the money. It doesn't work that way. Community property losses. If you earned it during the marriage, half of it goes to your spouse. So if wife earned it during the marriage, buys that property, husband gets 50% of it. But if wife uses her separate property from before she got married or inheritance, to buy a property, then that's her separate property. I got it. Thank you. No problem. Yeah. So a lot of people get confused over community property, separate property. They look at what's on title. They think I earned the money, so I own it. It doesn't work that way. These dates are so important. So remember the date of marriage and the date of separation. And the date of separation um, that that, that that case that I talked to you guys about, you know, where the wife wanted 11 years and the husband wanted eight years, those years were so important too because that affected spousal support. If the wife won and she got 11 years, she gets lifetime spousal support. And if the husband won and got eight years, then he only has to pay her four years of support. So that's why they went to trial for a whole week on that issue. I have a I have a question to clarify what you just said. Sure. So if let's just say a husband had an inheritance from their parents and he used uh that money from the inheritance, for example, let's say the parents gave him a house. Uh so now during the marriage, he's gonna take out an equity loan on that house to buy a new house, and it's all his funds, even though he's married. That new house that he's buying, since he's got, since he got the money from the inheritance of that house, would that be his house even in the future if they got divorced? Yeah, because he's using separate property to buy new property. So unless he transmutes it to community property by adding the wife's name, but if he doesn't transmute it to community property, then it stays separate property. Okay, yeah, because that's a big question sometimes. So somebody wants to buy, they go, oh, man, you know, if I buy it, you know, it's like community, then my wife's going to get half, and that holds them back from buying sometimes. Yep, yep, that happens a lot. And also, there is a um, case called the Morris Marsden case. That applies when, let's say, it's a separate property, but they used money that was earned during the marriage to build an ADU in the back or they use it to renovate the house, or they used it to pay the property taxes. The Morris Marsden law says that the spouse will be able to get half of all those improvements back. So then they would have to calculate how much the property appreciated in value with those community contributions. So she won't automatically get 50-50, just half of the portion that she put in. Half of the portion that the community put in. Yeah. Yep, exactly. All right. Well, I hope I, uh, you know, give you guys some good education today. If you guys have any additional uh, questions, um, here is uh, my contact information. Um, here's our website, email. Um, my Instagram account. So you feel free to email me. If you want um, these uh, slides that I shared today as well, feel free to email me and I'd be happy to share them with you. Okay, uh, question, because uh, I know like, you know, our clients always call us, say, do you know an attorney to do this? You know, attorney to... Now, what's your consultation fee? Um, we actually do a free 10 minute consultation um, okay. for any new clients. And then if they want to go more in depth, we give them 50% off our hourly rate for either the first 30 minutes or the first 60 minute consultation. 
So if they have a lot of questions, then they probably want to book a 60 minute consultation. If they, you know, think they just have 30 minutes is enough, then they can book 30 minutes. But their first paid consultation is 50% off the attorney's hourly rate. So let's say if the so, attorney's so what's the hourly rate, rate? Um, every we have eight attorneys in our law firm. So every attorney's hourly rate depends on how many years of experience they have. So if the attorney's rate is four hundred dollars. An hour, the first hour is two hundred dollars. The first thirty minutes is a hundred dollars. Oh, okay, because I probably refer you a client because I referred her to a, another attorney and he took care of like half of her problem, and then the other half he told her that he doesn't do that. So I believe you might be able to handle this this client of mine. Okay, that that'd be great. Thank you so much. Does your law firm do uh uh what do you call living trust like that? We do. Yeah. Maybe Rudy, okay. you want me to come back and do a presentation on trust and wills next time. But yes. yeah, we do. A put, it, put it on the chat, you guys. If you learn something this morning and you would like to have attorney Elizabeth Yang to come back here on asset planning, put it on the chat and we'll set it up. I know Elizabeth is going to go on a couple of weeks family vacation. So after, after you get refreshed and recharge, <laughs> maybe we'll... <laughs> If you have time, Elizabeth, I know you are like super busy now, uh, by the way, uh, Attorney Elizabeth Yang, I think you're running for an office there for Montreal Park, right? So uh, once you come back, I think we'll set up a class sometime in September or October for you to do an asset planning uh, class. Yes, okay. that is very good. Yeah. By the way, Attorney, is that somewhere here in the slides that you mentioned about that word transmuted? What was that word again? That is uh, transmutation. Transmutation. Um, yeah, I'll put it in the chat so that okay. you know how to spell it. But be careful, Jen. I just want to make sure, Jen, you are not telling the clients this. This is a legal oh, advice, no, no. This right? This is just so, my internal Yes, knowledge. this is for your own knowledge so you can speak <laughs> intelligently. This is how you're going to... You're going to use the information that you learned this morning to separate yourself from your competition, right? To get more listings, basically, right? But then at the end of yes. the day, you're going to connect the client to uh, to Elizabeth's office. That's what. That's how it's going to roll. You know what I mean? You and yes. I, we are not going to give a legal advice. <laughs> no, 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 no. It's just like, uh, yeah. And you know, the beauty about working with Elizabeth's office is that the first 10 minutes, they're going to give an hour because they want to see, do you get a real case or not, right? If you have nothing, then just go away, basically. <laughs> exactly, yeah. yeah. The first 10 minutes is all free. <laughs> Yeah, but transmutation. The first time I hear that word, transmutation. Yes. Yeah, yeah, that's an important word in real estate. So, uh, Elizabeth, I know that before COVID, um, some of the living trust law firms they offer free seminars. Like once a month, they'll offer one free seminar in English and one free seminar in Mandarin for uh, the clients to attend themselves, so they can know and learn about things like um, poison pill for instance, in terms of in the trust that they can add. And I felt like it was very important and helpful to me whenever I spoke with buyers to help them actually encourage them to be able to proceed forward and buy. So I was wondering if you guys have any assistance like that, because preferably I prefer not to give legal advice. So usually I take a flyer from those classes and then I hand it to the buyer themselves. Yeah. And it, it helped me close so many more deals than I would have otherwise. So I was wondering if you guys offer anything like that so is there... we do yeah we do uh especially during the pandemic we did so many zoom workshops and and we recorded it like today today's is also recorded so Rudy if you can send me the recording that would be great because I can add it onto my YouTube channel um all the previous recorded trainings and workshops I've done I uploaded to the uh, YouTube channel which I just shared in the chat so if you go on there I basically cover almost every topic that I specialize in. And oh, wow. So, yeah. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I, that's that's great to hear. It would be great if you could come back for another session too, because I felt like the Living Trust really does help because we have so many questions getting from that, from the clients. Yeah, so Living that's... Trust is really popular. Everyone is um, asking for estate planning presentations. Right. And I do have my estate planning presentations on recording on YouTube. But oh. of course, happy to come to speak to Rudy's team live anytime. Okay, so Thank Elizabeth, so this much. is how it's going to go, right? You're going to go on vacation next week. Um, and then when you come back, you're going to win your election in Monterey Park, right? Before you get busy with the public service, uh, we're going to... We're gonna we're gonna make sure you're gonna do. It sounds like Elizabeth, you have two. Uh, we have two requests here, right? The first, you're gonna do the training for the agents, or maybe, uh, and also we're gonna invite our VIP clients themselves 
right? Every year, uh, we help a thousand families to buy and sell their homes. So we have a lot of VIP clients. We're going to invite our VIP clients, uh, put it into your asset protection uh, class where you're going to go over living trust and uh, asset protection uh, session. And then, so we can do it here in our office here or yeah, I think that that will be the best way. So I'm going to send you a separate email so we can nail down the date and time and then we're going to share it to everybody. Okay, that sounds great. Yeah, my election is not till November, so I can come and speak uh, September, October, anytime before the election. <laughs> Mont uh, who lives in Montreal Park? Put it on the chat below. Who lives in Montreal Park? You know who to vote by November. <laughs> <laughs> Hi, Elizabeth. I just had one last question. Um, I know you're with some of the real estate stuff and estate planning. Um, on Proposition 19, are you able to help with the client with Proposition 19? Uh, yeah, we can give them a consultation about that. No problem. Oh, yeah. Okay, great. That's a big one because it seems it's that's the Proposition 19 with the taxes. It's just so involved. It's so difficult to like. Yeah, and it's a very popular topic right now. Okay, great. All right, good. Perfect. Thanks. <laughs> no problem. All right. Well, I got to hop off. I have another consultation I got to jump on to. So nice to talk to everyone. Thank here. you so much. Elizabeth. Thank you so Make much. It a great for day. Thanks for having me. Thank you. Enjoy <laughs> your vacation.